Yeah, welcome to Tuesday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. More specifically, this is a series called Millennial Mind. And today for our Millennial Mind, we have uh, Christopher Lindsay. Um, we have tracked Christopher Lindsay through his scientific and astronomical career. You know, they named an exoplanet after him, didn't they? Well, he found one. He discovered one back in the Iolani days. And then he went to USC and then we caught up with him right now where he is uh, hopefully en route to Yale. Welcome to the show, Christopher. It's so nice to see your smiling face. We like to check in with you every now and then and follow your career. Yeah. <laughs> nice to see you too. Thank you for having me on. Well, it's been a, been a few years and I want to first, I want to catch up on USC. Uh, there you were leaving Iolani, trundling off to uh, go to college. How was it? Give us, give us a little precy about um, how yeah. was it for you and how it changed you? Yeah, so interesting story about uh, I guess my college trajectory is I left Iolani after my junior year uh, to go to USC. I applied for colleges early and uh, <laughs> just to see, you know, where I'd get in and, and what the prospects were. But I ended up going. Uh, I was thankful to have a full scholarship because USC is one of the most expensive schools, you know, out there. So <laughs> next to NYU, I think. Uh, and is in an expensive area in Los Angeles. Uh, so you can be thankful. careful about NYU, Christopher. That's my school. <laughs> I, I, I went to law school there twice. I think the uh, there's always a list of which school has the has the richest you know students, and I think USC is usually second place to NYU. <laughs> but just barely. You know, we have all the Hollywood people, but NYU has all the. Uh, the investment bankers it's true fact. <laughs> and uh <laughs> other other wealthy intelligent people anyway so i was thankful uh that the trustees of usc paid for my my college education there uh with the trustee scholarship and i you know i had a great time freshman year made a lot of friends i started in the uh, astronomy major uh, but in that process also added uh, environmental studies and uh, jazz minors. Environmental well, studies major and a jazz minor. So two uh, majors and a minor. Let me just count that through. So astronomy, jazz, and uh, environmental studies. Yeah. You put, that, you put that in a bowl and mix it up, and what do you get? I, I guess you get something that looks like me. Um, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> but I think that's really a, a testament to how flexible USC was with you know what you wanted to study and they had a lot of resources for for all those different things you know in Los Angeles you have all these uh famous studio musicians I play the drums and one of the uh drum professors there is you know first call on all these studios uh to play on you know the Lion King and La La Land and oh, that's great. types of movies <laughs> and uh in the fields of environmental science, there's also a lot of good stuff happening at USC. It's a very, you know, progressive environmental school with a lot of uh, good stuff happening, both on the policy end of things and also on the scientific end where I sort of fall, as you would imagine. I do <laughs> imagine. <history. laughs> uh, USC has a really cool campus out on Catalina Island, which is, uh, you know, a couple miles offshore of the port of Long Beach. Uh, so I was able to go and, and there. You can only see it on yeah. some days, am I right? Yeah. If you're, if you're in Long Beach, you may not cloudy. be able to see it on a given morning. Yeah. Yeah, wow. there's that marine layer that comes in. So frequently we'd, we'd leave the port of Long Beach on, on USC's boat <laughs> and arrive at their uh, Catalina Island campus called the Wrigley Institute. I don't know if it's named after the bubble gum. I'm not sure. I think it might Maybe. be. Maybe. Probably yeah. not. Anyway, and they have a, a nice area over there that you could, uh, it's basically a, you know, research campus and a, and a scuba diving situation. And they also have the, the uh, pressure housing that you go into when you get the bends. Anywhere oh, on nice. the Southern California coast, if you get the bends, you will be treated by uh, USC doctors at their pressure chamber. Oh, which was cool to see. Yeah, and uh, in the fields of astronomy, I was very thankful to work with, uh, for four years, a uh, professor of astronomy at USC named Edward Rhodes, uh, Dr. Rhodes. 
And he did, you know, wonderful job mentoring me. And I had a lot of opportunities thanks to him. Uh, USC has some connections with the Mount Wilson Institute and the Mount Wilson Observatory, uh, which is a very historic uh, institute and observatory with telescopes, many telescopes that are you know older than 100 years. And I'm sure everyone has heard of the Hubble Space Telescope and Edwin Hubble, uh, the namesake of that telescope, did most of his research at Mount Wilson. And that's where we discovered that there was more galaxies beyond just our own Milky Way, uh, which we didn't know prior to the early 1900s. We just thought that, oh, these fuzzy objects that are now we know to be galaxies are just, you know, little clouds of dust in our own galaxy. And, you know, maybe our whole universe is only a couple hundred kiloparsecs, you know, a couple hundred light years large. But in reality, it's billions of light years <laughs> large. And the universe got a lot bigger thanks to research done at Mount Wilson. Mm -hmm. And uh, I personally worked on the same telescope as Edwin Hubble worked on, which is kind of trippy considering it was, you know, 100 years apart, uh, but okay. it's still up and running. And uh, we took data uh, for Jupiter in support of NASA's Juno mission, which is a satellite that is in a uh, orbit around Jupiter that takes various forms of data studying the planet's uh, atmospheres and uh, finding all about uh, finding out about Jupiter. And we did research on the methane layers of uh, Jupiter using the Mount Wilson 100-inch telescope. This was uh, original research. This was not just um, being being a member of a class in astronomy, am I right? No, yeah. There were four classes uh, in astronomy at USC, but this research uh, wasn't really part of that. I actually ended up being the only astronomy major in my year <laughs> at the end of it all um yeah we lost so the, the you and professor you and your yes. mentor professor Rhodes um out there at mount wilson you know um, um recognizing that you can have a telescope that lasts 100 years yeah you look you look west because while you were in school at usc we were having a, a bit of a tumultuous experience here at Montana. yeah uh, what did what did you and uh, Professor Rhodes think about that? Looking west. Yeah, yeah, it's it's hard because I do kind of see where a lot a lot of the animosity and and protests are coming from, because things have been you know very hard and and unfair for a long time, but I do think that astronomy in Hawaii and astronomy in the world would be a lot better off with the 30 meter telescope on top of Mauna Kea. It's a better sight uh, than the Canary Islands. Uh, but if I'm being, you know, frankly honest, I don't think that a lot of people really uh, un understand why one site could be better than another in such a significant way. And you know why should sacred land be given up for this this telescope that has kind of nebulous benefits uh, in terms of the science? Of course, there's something to be said for the the high tech jobs and and investment that would come from the telescope. Uh, so there's there's all sorts of things to think about at the same time, and it's you know hard to make a decision being so so directly impacted uh, by the by the telescope and also by you know the big island community in general and hawaiian yeah. community in general well if it, but looking at it mm, sort of in an optimistic way and and believing that it it can happen here culturally and community wise mm -hmm. um, what would be your your vision uh, for the telescope for mauna kea for uh, the Institute for Astronomy at UH, mm -hmm. uh, for astronomy in Hawaii, for Hawaii as a as a, as a home for astronomy, what yeah, what what could I happen that, here? Yeah, I think that Hawaii really could be 
you know, the capital of astronomy in the world. Right now, I would, I would venture to say that a lot of the most cutting edge astronomy uh, is now done in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Uh, but due to the orientation of Earth and the solar system in our galaxy, the Atacama Desert in Chile, Southern Hemisphere, perfect for studying the center of our galaxy. Uh, which is very interesting and can tell you a lot about you know, galaxy formation, how our galaxy formed, and uh, things about the supermassive black hole in our galaxy, Sagittarius A, all sorts of interesting things. But also in the center of the galaxy, where the southern hemisphere is pointing, is full of a lot of gas and dust, which obscures uh, stars when you try to look at uh, beyond our galaxy. But the Northern Hemisphere is better for uh, other things in astronomy, such as looking outside of our galaxy uh, towards uh, the, the edge of the universe, which is really what the 30 meter telescope would be best for. Because large aperture, you get, you know, the square of the radius times amount of light. And that would make studying very far away objects at the very start of the universe you know, possible. And it would be very interesting uh, and fascinating to have that data. And if that telescope was located in Hawaii, which I do hope it will be somehow, some way, I, I think that the Institute for Astronomy would see, you know, a great influx of, of minds from, from all over the world uh, coming to, you know, take data on, on the instrument. And I was talking about how, you know, some telescopes like the, the ones on Mount Wilson have been there for, you know, over a hundred years. Uh, but, you know, when you have the new instruments, to be honest, our group at USC is, is kind of the only ones actually taking real data on the, on the hundred inch historic uh, telescope on, on Mount Wilson. So telescopes, especially if they lie on, um, you know, contested land, don't have to, to last forever. I think that uh, that it would be important over the next, you know, 50 years, like how Keck, oh, my dog wants to get out, I'm sorry. Uh, just how Keck, how Keck impacted the field of astronomy so much. I think that the 30 meter telescope could do the same thing for the next, you know, few decades. And oh, I, and my, no, oh, sorry. Okay. My ideal belief for the future of astronomy as a field in general is, especially with this, this SpaceX launch that just happened, which was amazing. I really hope that one day, you know, giant telescopes in, in space could be, could be uh, the future in some way. Um, they're very hard to engineer, of course. We saw that with Hubble, multiple, you know, resupply missions costing billions of dollars to get that uh, running, but Hubble, you know, changed science forever. And, even, even, you know, I guess the general population understands the, the beauty and importance of the Hubble Space Telescope. And I think that could be uh, true in the future for future space telescopes, but also deep fields from uh, extra, extremely large telescopes uh, could also, I think, bring that sense of wonder. Well, yeah, and I wanna, I wanna go off that to, to ask you sense of wonder indeed. Um, and it strikes me that with all the trouble we have on the planet right now with uh, coronavirus, with protests, with, um, you know, call it uh, uh, political aggression and all, uh, suppression of minorities and the like, mm -hmm. um, you know, where, where does it all fit? Um, these people, uh, you know, engaged in, you know, various um, contentious activities around the planet or victims of the coronavirus or other, mm, other phenomena. Um, what do they care about astronomy? What does it mean to them? And therefore, what does it mean to us? Uh, why should we get excited? Why should we care, Chris? That's a very good question. <laughs> and a very you know, deep and expansive question. I think that you know, it's, it's true that some things, in my opinion, come before uh, before astronomy, you know, yeah, I don't think that it's it's a good thing to, you know, put blinders on and ignore everything that's happening on the world to go 
look at look at space. Uh, but I think that fundamental research into how the universe works, which is at its core what astronomy is, you know, since the beginning of time, we wondered, oh, you know, does the does the universe revolve around Earth? You know, no. Does the universe around all the sun? No. You know, learning our place in the universe and uh, can kind of, in some sense, bring us all together because we're all part of a, the same community that's in a very small point in the vast great universe that exists outside of Earth's atmosphere. And I think that it's important to learn about what's outside of us so we could value more the community that we have down here. Yeah, it puts um, things in perspective. Oh yeah. And there's a lot of those, you know, pictures that I look at, especially of Earth from space, uh, that you think about, uh, for example, uh, there's a picture that Buzz Aldrin took on Apollo 11 of, you know, of Neil Armstrong and the Earth in the background. And the only people, you know, that have ever lived and died that aren't in that picture is, are Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins on the, uh, on the module, but everyone forgets about him. <laughs> and that can really, you know, at least for me personally, you know, put some perspective into, into these uh, widespread, you know, conflicts and maybe we should all, all treat each other uh, a little better, <laughs> seeing that, you know, we're, we're very similar, even though maybe down here on a microscopic level, you can only see differences, but uh, from a, from a space-based view, you know, community is 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 very important it's, but yeah. i do think that yeah. you know some people in the uh, astronomy community uh you know feel like oh we should be completely apolitical and only care about you know what our research is but i don't think that's you know that's really really helpful to anyone to be honest mm. yeah and you have to be able to articulate a view that supports your own your own science mm. uh, otherwise sci science cannot live by itself it is an expression of community all right let's let's go forward and um and talk about uh, the transition by the way you got you got um a free ride at usc uh yeah i did and i also worked as a resident assistant for three years which was very fun and rewarding and a growth experience for me but also gave me free food and free lodging which is which is very what nice. a deal what a deal <laughs> i know it's a great deal other schools <laughs> don't give their ras free food or free or free housing that's fair so that's very thankful for and that. on top of all of that can you share with us how well you did um in, in what sense my my personal growth or i did you know fairly well in my classes it was definitely an adjustment going from you know junior year in high school uh to my my first year of college, you know, living outside of Hawaii for the first time that I can remember, and um, yeah, it was the first semester uh, was definitely a, a change for me. I had my worst grades that I've probably ever had in my life. Um, I got a C plus in calculus one, and I already knew how to do calculus, so I don't know how that happened. Uh, I missed one of the midterms due to over over sleeping. Oh, no. uh, which is probably why, <laughs> but I never did that ever again or missed an assignment ever again. <laughs> well, that's again. what college is all about, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah, but I ended up, uh, you know, magna cum laude, and I, you know, I had a lot of other you know, extracurricular activities, not only research, uh, but, you know, doing the RA, doing the RA thing, um, doing uh, scientific scuba diving, which was, which was very fun, uh, participating in, in music, and I, I won a couple awards. <laughs> I feel weird talking about you know myself, myself and my accomplishments so much, but I'll, I'll just list some of them for you. Um, Please. I was a Warren Bennis Scholar, which was a leadership program at uh, USC, named after a, a famous leadership guru who who advised you know multiple presidents and was the you know one of the higher up administrators at the university and was the president of a couple other universities. 
So Warren Bennett Scholar was a great way for me to meet some other, you know, great leaders and some other people that, you know, I generally wouldn't interact with you know, outside of the, my sciences path. Uh, there was a lot of, you know, political science, international relations students, global health students, and people that are really, I feel, going to make a, a big difference in the world uh, from USC. So that's good that I, uh, I'm very thankful to be able to be in that same program with them. I was also a, okay. Uh I'll just finish, yeah, go, go, this, go ahead. This finish, finish and we'll go to the pictures. Yeah. Okay. I'll just listen really quick. I was a thematic option scholar, which was a honors track in the in kind of English, which is not really my, my forte to be honest, but it was, you know, very fun. And I got to uh, learn from some, some great professors about areas of study that I never would have uh, looked at before I took, you know, an Arabic literature class that I've never <laughs> would have And why not? And why before. not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was last semester too. So my last semester, I was, I was reading a bunch of uh, those books that really give an eye into that, that region of the world that I hadn't yeah. really thought about before. Yeah, it's great. I was Renaissance scholar, which just means that you had a major minor in, in very different fields. I was also a discovery scholar, which means I wrote kind of a a uh, thesis, some of my of my research work at USC, which was which was good, and I also won a, a honor called the Order of the Laurel and the Palm, which is uh, I'm not it, it's supposed to be for it, exemplary leadership and high achievement. I'm reading it, <laughs> good, <laughs> but it's given to you know a, a couple ten or twelve. Uh, students every year at, at USC and I'm and I know a lot of the other people that won that award and I was very thankful to be recognized in the same plane as as those great leaders. Recognizing you're not finished reading but recognizing we have only a limited amount of time I want to take a, I want to switch off here and go to the yeah, photos that's and can you briefly I'm describe. Done, by the way. That was all I Oh, okay oh perfect perfect <laughs> I must have known. Um, let's let's quickly go through your photos and you can identify them. Then I want to talk about Yale. Yeah. So, so what do we got? What the, do we got uh, here? This is the Juno probe uh, superimposed on an image of Jupiter, uh, which we were doing, you know, uh, additional observations for using the ground-based telescope. Because uh, Juno, when it hits the Perigeove passage, which is its closest passage to Jupiter, it is very close to Jupiter's surface, and the the cameras are taking pictures of you know various uh, different abundances of different molecules on Jupiter, trying to learn more about its composition and atmosphere. And we take you know global, global, <laughs> Jupiter's globe, pictures of Jupiter uh, to kind of place the Juno probe uh, in context of the of the wider uh, planet. So that's just a picture of of Juno and Jupiter. Okay. What else? We, we know got? the story of, of Juno and Jupiter. I'm sorry, this is just a funny thing. I don't have to go into it. <laughs> no, but okay. Juno, Juno is the Roman name for Hera's wife. And Jupiter is, I'm sorry, Juno is the <laughs> Roman name for Hera, who is, you know, Zeus's wife. And Jupiter is the Roman name for Zeus. So Juno is going to check up on, you know, her husband. <laughs> And the moons of her husband, such as Io, Ganymede, uh, Europa, which are all, you know, Jupiter's other, other women, so to speak. <laughs> so all of these moons of Jupiter are named after the other women in Jupiter's life. And the probe to go sent to look at them is named after Jupiter's uh, spouse. It's great to be a god like that, yeah. Yeah, all kinds of yeah. options. <laughs> and they keep on finding more and more Jupiter moons, uh, which is, you know, cool. And there's a lot of them. <laughs> okay, now the next. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I can resist the picture. Uh, so this is uh, scuba diving, uh, myself scuba diving in the Bahamas, which was a, a class given by USC, a summer class, uh, which was, you know, very fun, rewarding. Uh, we were looking at coral reefs in particular. and which is a you know tragic situation right now. Uh, they're very sensitive. Coral polyps are very sensitive to small changes in water temperature and acidity. 
and we were looking at possibly uh, using small pieces of coral and attaching them to artificial structures uh, to encourage the rate of growth of the coral animal, which usually grows, you know, slower than your fingernail, uh, but can be increased in growth speed by putting it, you know, closer to the sun at uh, during the day when they can get the maximum amount of sunlight, uh, because symbiotic plant cells basically in the coral polyps generate energy for the coral polyps using the sun. Uh, and putting it deeper in the water uh, at night when these coral polyp animals can consume uh, more nutrients uh, that are more abundant at deeper levels. So we were looking at that while in the Bahamas. That was on an island called Eleuthera, which is a you know very thin crescent, crescenty island uh, with you know probably a thousand or so people that are living on it. So that was very very interesting and oh, great, great experience. Great experience. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we got any more? Yeah, there we are. So this is uh, a couple of the people that, uh, you know, a couple of my mentors and, and fellow students uh, outside of the, the dome of the 100 inch telescope on top of Mount Wilson, and the second man to the uh, left looking at it is uh, Dr. Rhodes. And the one right to the right of myself third from the left in the middle uh is is steven pinkerton who is uh another one of my mentors he's a graduate student right now mm -hmm. yeah okay um i want to uh, we only have a little little time left and i want to take a moment uh so you did you apply uh, to various schools or did you go uh, sailing directly to yale um I applied to uh, a lot of schools, actually. It was a very, uh, I don't want to say difficult, but it was definitely a challenging process. When you apply to physics and astrophysics and astronomical uh, PhD programs, they're funded, you know? So it's kind of like a job in some sense, uh, asking to be you know, funded to do research <laughs> uh, from universities. So they don't make it, you know, terribly easy. <laughs> and there's a lot of competition as well. There's, you know, lots of people around the world that would like to uh, be astronomers and that have worked, you know, extremely hard. And you take a test, which is called the physics GRE, which was a standardized test that tests your knowledge of basically all of physics. So everything from, you know, basic mechanics, blocks on ramps, uh, which everyone sees probably in high school, uh, all the way up to, you know, the, the beginnings of particle physics and quantum mechanics and things like that. So it's a lot to study, you know, thousands of years of, of collective human knowledge. <laughs> so I spent about a year studying for that test. Oh, really? And I still didn't do terribly well, uh, but I got into a, a couple places and there was, uh, a lot going on at, at Yale that I really uh, wanted to be a part of. And also my mentor at USC, Dr. Rhodes, uh, has a good relationship with uh, some of the professors at Yale because Dr. Rhodes tried to hire them for USC, but lost that bidding war, I suppose. <laughs> so are you on a free ride at Yale too? Yeah, so they, I want a fellowship called the Gruber Science Fellowship, uh, which is, uh, all all PhD students are are funded in the natural sciences generally uh, because you do research for the university and you also teach. Um, but I have, have additional funding from a uh, group, the Gruber Foundation, which is a foundation affiliated with Yale that does a ton of very interesting stuff in in biology, chemistry, genetics, and in and in social sciences too. Uh, they have a fellowship at a law school for for uh, women's rights studies and, and things like that. So it's a wide reaching uh, organization. And I was, and I'm thankful to win their, there's one of their science fellowships. Oh, that's uh, great. So uh, it's gonna take you a little while to finish a master's in science, I guess in astronomy. And, <clears throat> and then uh, my guess is you'll take a PhD. Um, yeah. Maybe at Yale, so you get accepted to the PhD program 
and you get a master's on the way. So oh, good. Okay. you're kind of, you're expected to, you know, finish your doctoral thesis at Yale eventually, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. however okay. long that may take. <laughs> and you're, you're committed to a, a PhD in some, some yeah. area of uh, astronomy. Yeah. Well, you don't have to choose an advisor immediately. That's one other thing that is, is cool about uh, Yale is you, you kind of, you know, do a couple projects with a couple different people and see which kind of area, which advisor student relationship you like and, and which area of, of astronomy and astrophysical science you want to directly go into. Whether that's, you know, that could be studying black holes and extremely energetic uh, objects or uh, studying, you know, objects in our own solar system. There was a study by a Yale professor named uh, Greg Laughlin that was looking at that Oumuamua a uh, long cigar shaped asteroid uh, that flew through our solar system going zillions of miles an hour, very strange object uh, that was, you know, interstellar. It didn't, it's not part of our own solar system. And that's very interesting because we've never really seen terrestrial uh, things <laughs> outside of our solar system. Well, I'm, I'm sure really you're going to see all kinds of things that will surprise and delight in the next few years. But I have two more questions before we, before we have to leave. And uh, one of them is, what are the chances with all of this that you'll come back and make a career or that you could come back and, and make a career here in Hawaii? Hey? I think it's you know, very possible. Um, I would love to work at the, the UH Institute for Astronomy, either as you know, postdoctoral researcher, generally after you finish your your doctorate, you go to a different institution and, you know, continue your research and possibly do some teaching. Uh, and I would, you know, love to teach astronomy and physics at, you know, any university really, but I think it would be especially, you know, impactful here in Hawaii uh, to do teaching and research. And especially if there's world-class telescopes um, mm, on Mauna sure. Kea, still like how they are now. Sure. Um, I would, I would love to be <laughs> able to access those because, you know, astronomy is a, a pretty expensive science in the grand, in the grand scheme of things. If you don't have the, uh, generally in the, in history, only the, only the richest people did astronomy. Well, sure. The, the consortium that's expected to uh, build a 30 meter telescope is putting in 1.5 billion. So yeah. that's expensive. Let me go to my last question. And, and that is to put this all in perspective in the world in which we live. Um, Yale is not sure what it's gonna do as a university. And that includes mm -hmm. astronomy. It includes your program. It includes um, you know, the, your activities on or with campus. Where does that stand now? You're, you're in, you're supposed to go. Mm -hmm. It's coming close in, in two or three months, you know, there'll be a big crunch. What is Christopher gonna do? Is he going to go there? Is he going to go remote? Is he going to wait? Hmm, does anybody know? Yeah, I wish I knew too. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 nice though that you know if I were graduating with you know like a a business degree or something like that, and you know from USC that's that's you know a uh, a good thing to have and a, a lucrative degree to hold, but it would be very hard to you know find find work. At the very at this very moment, uh, in you know, in in what as a job that you would want to have, it, that was when me. But in academia, uh, it's somewhat. Once you get the position, it's somewhat insulated from from these uh, from these goings on in the in the overall world that affect the economy so devastatingly. And you know, Yale is has has a lot of money. <laughs> I've heard that. So so they they can they don't really rely so much on on yearly you know payments uh, to keep their their situation running. They can they almost entirely uh, in terms of research are funded by you know government grants or from their endowment. And they spend, you know, about a billion dollars a year on research, and part of that will be towards my my stipend and uh, my research 
continuing. Well, what about COVID though, Chris? What about COVID? What about social distancing and masks? What about remote connection like we're having now? Yeah, um, so my last semester at USC. What about the ordinary classroom experience? Yeah. yeah, my last semester at USC was, you know, remote for the most part, but they, USC put out a statement saying that they would have in-person college classes for those that want it. Uh, they would also have the uh, option to take it online uh, up until Thanksgiving. So they're cutting the semester short, squeezing more into less. Uh, and Yale hasn't put out a statement like that, but I suspect that their college might, um, might do a similar thing with a shortened semester in class for those that want it. And if you have you know, in-person classes, you have to have you know, grad students PhD candidates to, you know, teach sections, teach labs, and, uh, you know, grade papers and that sort of thing. So you're going uh, to opt so, to go to class? So and I would, I, I would go to class, I think, with a mask and far enough away from everyone else. There's not too many people that, you know, are uh, accepted and go to astronomy programs. So in my year, there's, uh, less than, you know, I think there's eight people that- <laughs> So you, you won't have any problems social distance. Yeah, yeah there's, there's eight people eight in class. People. <laughs> you know, it's not like a beginning OCHEM class. Like at, at USC, the OCHEM lectures are, you know, 200, 300 people. Yeah. <laughs> but we you gotta, know, we not that go many now. people we're, study we're out of time. cars. <laughs> but I want to circle back with you, uh, you know, next time we can and find out how you're doing. I'd like to see more of you and talk to more of you and, uh, yeah. and keep in, in contact and connection. That's uh, Christopher great. Lindsay, a, a proud uh, graduate, a graduate, an early graduate of Iolani um, and uh, a spectacular career at USC and now only the best at Yale. Thank you so much, Chris. It's, it's wonderful right. to see Thank you. Thank you very time. much. Aloha.